Most of you are aware of supersonic flight. That's where you fly at speeds faster than the speed of sound. But a new word's creeping into our vocabulary, and that's called hypersonic flight. That's where you travel at more than five times the speed of sound. Generally speaking, it's quite expensive to develop this technology, so it's usually confined to countries like China, Russia, and the United States. But um, because of a twist in time and, and a lot of ingenuity, Australia is also playing a leading role in developing this technology. My name's Alan Paul, and for 20 years, I led most of the hypersonic flight testing undertaken in Australia. What you see here is the beginning of one of those flight tests. Now, I know you're all concentrating on the rocket, but that's not the important part. The shiny bit at the top is the important part. That's the experiment. The rocket's just a bus that pushes the experiment up to the right speed. And in this case, that experiment went up to 8,000 kilometers per hour. When I originally wanted to give this talk, I wanted to tell you about the technology that underpinned all these flight tests. But my young mentors to this talk were determined that I wasn't going to give you that talk. <laughs> they saw they had an opportunity to explore and understand what it was about me that led me here. After a while, I figured out that actually they had an ulterior motive. They had dreams, but they had challenges. And they were looking towards me to give them solutions to those challenges. I stepped back a bit and I said, hang on, you've got all the solutions. But then I realized they couldn't see them. They couldn't see them because they were blinded by their imagination, which was flooding them with thoughts about all the things that could possibly go wrong. Well, in my experience, it's not unusual to be paralyzed like that. So, because of their persistence, I'm going to give you my story in the hope that it'll help somebody to transform their dreams into reality. So, I want to start with this photograph. It was taken in 1969 when I was in grade five at Kingston State School. For those of you who can't find me, I'm the, the one on the left on the second row. Kingston in those days was a dairying community. It's a far cry from what it is today. Some of the kids would ride horses to school. Well, I was pretty trendy. I had a bike. And if you look at that photograph, you'll see that I was also one of the few kids that actually had shoes. But apart from these minor differences, I think it's fair to say that my upbringing was fairly normal. But as we've seen, every year is special. And 1969 was special to me because in July of that year, mankind was prancing around on the moon for the very first time. I was sitting underneath the school building, looking up at this small black and white TV, highly contrasted, and watching a man walk down a set of steps onto the lunar surface. I found that really exciting. But the one thing that stuck with me wasn't actually that, but it was the descent of the lunar module down to the moon's surface. They face computer overloads. There was a much bigger crater there than there should have been, and there was rocks. And not only that, they had time pressure. They were running out of fuel. The things I've taken away from that are two things. One, they were absolutely determined to get onto the surface of the moon. But because of that determination and because of that time pressure, they were forced to find solutions to their problems without worrying too much about the what-ifs. And I think that is a, a brilliant example of where that approach works. Well, while all this excitement was going on around me, at home, my mum and dad, they would provide me with books for Christmas and uh, my birthdays. And this book's something like this. I had a bit of a reading problem, and you know, to be quite honest, sometimes I sit back and go, oh no, not another book. But the, the truth of the matter is the illustrations in those books, they drove my imagination to design things. Things like cars and planes and even cities. And we had a garage full of junk, 
and I would go and build those designs. Well, as the years progressed, these designs got more elaborate, but I do have to admit, even when I was at high school, they were quite immature. And then, something transformed my life. Now, before I tell you about that, I want to digress just for a second. Everybody here has a mentor. Some of you don't know about it, but you do. My mentor was my brother, Ross. He was very popular at school. He was always the top of his grade. And as he was my elder brother, he was always right, most of the time. <laughs> but he also had a PhD in applied mathematics. Now, I know mathematics isn't everybody's cup of tea, but mathematics is a really delicate art that's extremely powerful. Mathematics allows you to model just about anything. And by modeling, I mean you can write down a set of equations which represents what you're trying to describe. It may be an engineering problem. It may be the spread of a disease. Just about anything, though. Now, Ross could then simplify these equations and take the essence out of them, then solve them analytically. And this allowed him to design. And in fact, it's the same way they design 747s. It's the same way they design space shuttles. And even today, a good designer does exactly the same thing. Well, I saw that. And I wanted that too. So I too enrolled in a mathematics course at the University of Queensland. And I too eventually got a PhD in applied mathematics. I say eventually because I wasn't really the most studious postgrads. I loved exploring. In fact, Ross and I climbed just about every peak in southeast Queensland. We explored just about every road. We even explored roads that didn't exist anymore. But then we discovered sailing. Ross bought a boat first, and then it wasn't very long afterwards that, that I wanted the boat. Now, we just didn't go and buy a boat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we designed a boat, and we built the boat. And it went pretty fast, and I won a few races. But the stress of racing was a bit too much for me. I much more preferred exploring. So one day, I came up with this brilliant idea was, you know, we should explore the Barrier Reef with our two 14-foot catamarans. You know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so we hitched the boats up to the car and we drove up to North Queensland and we had one big adventure. But I can remember that every day of our adventure, every day it took my dogged determination to actually be alive at the end of the day. <laughs> and the one thing I remember from this whole experience was that <laughs> you've got to solve the problems and not worry too much about the consequences or the potential problems. Well, we eventually did get back to the boat ramp and uh, as we were packing the boats up, we both agreed that this adventure wasn't over and we needed to come back. We needed to come back and we needed to come back in a bigger boat. But our, and our father was there and he came over and he says, yeah, he says, you probably need a shower in that bigger boat. <laughs> so, anyway, at this point in time, I was a young mathematician, a bit of a free spirit, um, and looking for a job. And then along came this man, Professor Ray Stalker, and he offered me a job. Ray was the founder of hypersonics in Australia. And he asked me to do these experiments on scramjets. Scramjets are air-breathing engines, just like a normal jet engine, but they work at really fast speeds. Uh, there's a picture of one in the background there. Now, the concept had been around for a long time, but um, they hadn't um, matured because the, they didn't have the wind tunnels to do that. Now, Ray had invented the thing called the free piston shock tunnel, and it could do that. This is an example of the T4 shock tunnel, which is still operational at the University of Queensland today. I can tell you 
that they're the most cantankerous, dirty machines that exist. If you want to do any testing, they're one of the best. I did a lot of experiments, got a lot of data, developed my own theories on scramjets, and we got to the point where we actually produced an engine that worked. In fact, that photograph that you saw before was the very first photograph of a scramjet working. So we published the results. And then trouble started. Our peers said we didn't have enough test time. Now, the test time is effectively the time that the engine's running for. Now, to, to give you an idea of that time, I want you to all blink. Go on, blink. Thank you. Now, the test time we had was two milliseconds, which was a lot less than what the time that you took to blink. So you kind of get the idea that these guys might be right. But I was a mathematician. I had the equations. And I said, no, we're right. Notwithstanding, this was a point of difference that we had to resolve if we were going to move forward with our scramjet testing. Then another bit of luck came along. I was offered some rocket motors to do some flight testing. So I figured that if I put the experiment that I'd done in the tunnel on the top of that rocket motor, and I used the rocket motor to push it up to the right speed, that I'd actually have five seconds of test time, over 2,000 times more than I had in the tunnel. And this would resolve the problem if I could compare the two results. And that was the birth of the High Shot flight program. It was a high risk, high gain adventure. The vice chancellor loved it. Everywhere he went, he'd be skiting to everybody, oh, you kids doing a rocket program. Well, then he kind of used to add the caveat, but, you know, the guy in charge of it is a little bit crazy, right? <laughs> so, anyway, we, confronted, we were confronted with many, many challenges. High Shot 1 crashed and burned. But eventually, High Shot 2 delivered the results, and we compared it with the tunnel tests, and they were the same. You could say persistence won the day, but the reality was we could move on with our tunnel testing. Then Ray Stalker, he had become a friend and a mentor by this time, he came up to me and said, hey, Alan, what are you going to do now? And I sat back for a while and I thought, you know, this, this flight testing stuff's a lot of fun. So we subsequently went on to do High Shot 3, when we did High Shot 4, and we did a much bigger flight called High Cause, where we flew a scramjet at 11,000 kilometres per hour. Then the Australian Defence Force got interested, and they took myself and my team that I'd developed and put us into Defence Science and Technology Organisation, where we undertook the High Fire program. We had graduated from doing a simple tunnel experiment to now attempting to fly a scramjet-powered plane at Mark 8, and that's about 8,000 kilometres per hour. We had grown from a team of four enthusiastic engineers to a team of well over a hundred respected people in the field. My brother, Ross, he was part of that team for most of the period. Without diminishing the efforts of any of the other team members and their families, because without them we'd never have been successful, Ross was pivotal in transforming my dream to reality. He wasn't only my brother, but he was somebody I could talk to about everything that was going on. And he was my friend. Well, while we were doing high fire, my wife and I decided to build that bigger boat, the one with the shower. For seven years, we faced challenges and built that boat. And then we decided, well, we're going to complete that dream and we're going to sail it up north, up to the Barrier Reef. So, we were leaving Morton Bay, and I remember looking over my shoulder and thinking, with some apprehension, well, you know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, we just want to ask my wife. According to her, lots of things can go wrong. <laughs> so, but eventually, we did reach 
Zoe Bay, which is in North Queensland, and the picture on the right is us entering Zoe Bay with the bigger boat. Now, the picture on the top left was taken 38 years prior when Ross and I had gone into Zoe Bay, and that's a picture of Ross in front of my boat. And the picture below, just coincidentally, was taken on the last trip looking in the same direction. Now, you notice one thing that's different though. Ross isn't there. Unfortunately, Ross died of cancer just before we left. I, I, I tried to solve that problem, as you would, but I failed. Um, and I learned how, how personal and how hard failure is. But then after a while, I realized failure is actually just on the path to success. So with that, I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Some people say that we're all born under a rainbow. Well, if that's true, the corollary to that is there's a bunch of gold sitting down the bottom there, which is yours, and you can spend it any way you like. But although you are provided with certain attributes, you need to develop determination. Sometimes you need to develop dogged determination to give you the persistence to find the one solution to your problem. You're going to fail sometimes. But you're going to be more successful if you work with a team and you have a mentor. Now here's the real important point. Don't let your imagination flood you with all the potential problems that you could have. Use it to develop the one solution you need to solve your problem. Because you only need one. Thank you.